And uh, I want to share something with you before we actually read any scripture. Uh, I want to tell you this from the bottom of my heart. Uh, as uh, your pastor, maybe you don't come here regularly, but um, as the pastor of this church, I want to share with you that I love you. And that everything that I do, it, it comes from my love for God and my love for you. And so I always have the best of intentions. Uh, I have an agenda when I get up here. Some people think, all oh, those preachers, they're, they're just trying to push their own agenda. And that's absolutely correct. I just want you to know what my agenda is. I want you to live the best life possible. I want you to have joy. I want you to have peace. I want you to experience the life that Christ died for you to live. My hope is that when you leave here on Sunday mornings that you'd be encouraged and that you could go out and live a better kind of life. I want you to know that Christ died for you and that he loves you but I'm not here to make you comfortable. Is that okay if I say that this morning? I'm not here to make you comfortable and I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm not here to tell you how to get more vacation time or how to get the promotion at work. I, I'm here to tell you how to live a life of joy and a life of purpose to make a difference in the world. More than anything, I want you to know that good news about Jesus and you know, some weeks I... I don't really get to choose what uh, I preach. I mean, I do to a certain extent, but the Lord lays things on my heart. And some, some weeks he gives me some things where you get excited and you get fired up and everybody leaves encouraged and, and leaving feeling better. And then some weeks he doesn't give you that kind of thing. Sometimes he gives you things that are hard, things that are rigid, things that are not necessarily fun. And so... I said all that to say that if I seem hard or harsh, it's because I love you. And if I say something today that challenges you, I'm not just trying to get up in your business. I'm trying to push you towards a life that's better than the one you're currently experiencing. And so, with all that being said, I want us to pray one more time and then we will start reading scriptures. Would you pray for me? I've experienced a little laryngitis this week, and I'm hoping my voice will hold out, and with the grace of God, it will. Uh, let's, let's pray. Uh, Father, we come to you today, and we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for Jesus and the cross, and Father, we thank you that your presence and your power is here this morning. God, I pray that you'd give me the strength that I need to, to speak the very words of life today. God, I pray that you would... Um, Help us to be encouraged and not discouraged. Help us to move towards you and not away from you. God, I pray that today that our lives and our hearts and our minds could be changed forevermore. And God, I pray that more than anything that we would know what it is to worship you with all of our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you, uh, if you have your Bible, turn over to the book of Exodus. Chapter 12 and chapter 32. Chapter 12 and chapter 32. If you don't have your Bible with you this morning, you can grab that gold Bible right in front of you, and you can use that one. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, you can take that Bible home with you today. But I want to give you some background about the book of Exodus as you're turning to chapters 12 and 32. The book of Exodus is all about an exit from the land of Egypt. Um, the children of a man named Jacob or Israel moved into Egypt um, because there was a famine, a drought happening in their homeland. And so when, when we say the children of Israel, we literally mean there was a man named Israel and these are his kids. But they uh, came into Egypt because of a drought and after they had been there so long, the Egyptians said, hey, we have all these people. Wouldn't it be nice if they'd done all our work for us? And so that's what they did. They made the children of Israel slaves. And God promised the children of Israel that he would bring them out. But that was 400 years, and they were still in captivity. They were still in Egypt. And so the people of God, the people of Israel 
had given up pretty much on ever getting out of Israel or out of Egypt until a man named Moses rises up as a leader. Now Moses is not a perfect man. In fact, he is a, a murderer and he's a coward. And so uh, that goes to prove that God uses some pretty imperfect people to do some pretty incredible things. But God raises up Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, he goes to Pharaoh, and I'm sure you've seen the movie. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, Pharaoh, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh says, no, no. But God sends ten powerful signs in the form of plagues on the people of Egypt. And all ten of these plagues are designed specifically by God to attack a, a little g God of Egypt. And so God, Egypt was a land that was full of all kinds of idols and false gods. They had ten main ones, and I'm not even going to try to tell you their names today because I'll butcher them. But these ten plagues that God sends onto the land of Egypt were targeted, aimed, pointed at destroying the reputations of these ten gods. And so the ten plagues tear down the idea of these ten gods. And the last plague was the plague where the firstborn of every household would die. And God told the people of Israel, if you'll do what I tell you to do on this particular night, there's going to be a... An uh, angel of death come through, but if you will kill a Passover lamb, a perfect lamb, and you'll plead the blood over the doorposts of your house, when that destroyer comes, he won't come into your home and kill your firstborn, which is a picture of Jesus, but we don't have time to go there today. And so maybe another day, if you want to hear about it, then I'll tell you about it after church, but... After the destroyer comes and kills the firstborn of all of Egypt, Pharaoh says, all right, fine. All right, fine. And that's where we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 12, chapter 12, verse 29. And we're going to read through verse 36. It records, at midnight the Lord struck down all of the firstborn of the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne... To the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and the, all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up and go out from among my people. Both you and the people of Israel go and serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. And for they said, we shall all be dead. And so the people took their dough before it was leavened in their kneading bowls, being bound up in their cloaks and on their shoulders. And the people of Israel had done also as Moses told them, for they asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have whatever they asked. Thus they planned, plundered the Egyptians. And so after God performs this last plague, uh, you could just imagine how worried the Egyptians must have been. And they said, whatever it takes to get you out of our land, we'll do it. Whatever you want, we'll give it to you. And so God instructs the people of Israel to take gold and silver from the Egyptians. And God's plan for this gold is that they would use it to build the tabernacle in the desert. So God gives them a gift to give back to him. But they, uh, when they leave Egypt, they see some pretty amazing things start to happen. Just a few days after they get into the desert, the Egyptians start pursuing them. 
and they're between the Egyptians and the Red Sea. And you probably know the story, but um, Moses prayed to God, and he stuck his staff down in the in the Red Sea, and it parts, and the Israelites go through on dry ground, and the Egyptians get drowned. And then later on, the people will get hungry because they're in a desert, and uh, God will send manna from heaven, which means what is it? It was uh, bread that was sweet to the taste, but it would just fall out of heaven every day. And then they said, well, we want some meat to eat, and God sent quail every day to they, the quail would just fall out of the sky and they had something to eat all of the time. In the desert where there was nothing to eat, God, they seen God provide for them in miraculous ways. Then one time they were thirsty. They didn't have anything to drink. And God sent water out of a rock in the middle of the desert. Just started pouring water. These people had seen God do some amazing things. When they were in the desert, he went before them in a cloud by day in a pillar of fire by night, and he guided them through the desert. These people had seen God's power. They had seen what God could do. But they camped next to this mountain on this particular occasion that we're about to read about, and Moses has been up on this mountain for a while now, and they're starting to get worried. What, ha what is happening on the mountain is that Moses has a business meeting with God. And he's getting the law of God. And he's in communion, in community with God up on this mountain. And Moses stays a little longer than what they think he ought to stay. And that's where we pick up in this story. And so... Over in Exodus 32, and we're going to read 1 through 6. I want to tell you what's happening in the camp of Israel. It says, When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, which is Moses' brother, and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this, Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so Aaron said to him, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. And so all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods. O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a pro proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up and early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. It sounds kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? That these people had watched God do these miraculous things. They had seen God's hand uh, destroy the gods of Egypt. They seen His hand destroy every single thing that the Egyptians had held in high esteem. They had seen God split the Red Sea. They had seen God bring manna from heaven and quail from the sky. And just, just because Moses stays on the mountain a few extra days, they turn to false gods. So quickly they turned from God. And it seems ridiculous because it says right here in the story that they had carried the gold out. There was nothing special about the gold and they carved it with their own hands. They knew, they understood that this thing was not God, and yet they bowed to worship it. It seems so silly when we talk about a golden calf, don't it? It seems so silly. Why would you do that? What, what was they thinking? Because we can see that it was just a calf. Why would they trade this ever-present God for a calf made out of gold? Why would they trade Almighty 
God for something that they made with their own hands. It seems so silly to worship golden calves. When we think about idol worship, we think about faraway lands and we think about golden calves and we think about pagan temples. Right? We think, now, I don't have one idol in my house. I don't have anything. The family don't gather around an idol and, and worship at night. I, we don't have any statues that we uh, pay extra reverence to. And we think we don't have a problem with idol worship. But I want to bring this a little closer to home for us. And so if you would, uh, they're going to play a video and just give your attention over to this video. watching TV the other day, and the show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshippers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted. They danced. They, they made sacrifices to their idols. They built these enormous temples to worship their idols. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario. One over the top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. We were made to worship. We were created to worship. God in the beginning designed human beings. To worship Him. It is in your DNA to worship. It is in your operating system wired straight in that you worship. So here's what I say today that every man, woman, and child, not just in this room, but on this planet, is worshiping something. Worshiping something. You cannot stop Worshipping. You may not realize that you are worshipping, but every single person worships something. Atheists may not even believe in worship, but they are worshipping something. And so, whether you know it or not, right now in your life, you are worshipping something. And here's the deal. If you don't make a conscious decision to worship God with your whole life, your mind, your will, your emotions, your resources, everything in your life, if you don't choose to worship God in that way, then you will fall into worshiping something else. You can either decide to worship God. That doesn't happen by accident. No choice is a choice when it comes to God. You can choose to give God your whole life or you are choosing to worship idols that are far less worthy of your worship. You're either worshiping God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul or you are worshiping something else or someone else. We look back at the Israelites and we think how foolish they are for abandoning the God who had brought them out of so much and trading Him for a cow that they had produced with their own hands. We see how foolish that is, but oftentimes we're clueless of how we have turned our hearts away from God. 
oftentimes we're clueless about the idols that we're worshiping in our own lives. Oftentimes we can't see in ourselves how we have built up idols in our life. You see, the thing about the Israelites was that God had given them a gift, a good gift. But they turned the good gift of God into a God. They turned the good gift from God into a God in their lives. And they began to worship the gift instead of the giver. They made themselves a God out of what God had given them. The, the, the truth is this morning, church, is that you may not have a golden calf built in your house. You may not have a statue of Buddha or a Hindu God, but... Chances are that idol worship may just be in your house, in your family, in your life. Our idols may not be golden calves, but they are real and they are dangerous. I want to take just a couple moments and I want to share with you what it means to worship an idol. And I want to show you how to identify one in your life because I believe that we can never live a life more abundant if we're worshiping idols in our life. And so, an idol is anything that we worship that is not God. Anything that we worship that is not God. An idol can be a person, it can be a place, it can be a thing, an idea. <coughs> an idol can even be you. You can be your own idol. You can be your own God. An idol is anything that you are willing to sacrifice to or for above God. An idol is anything that you put more significance on, put more weight in than you do on God. Think about it this way. An idol is something that if you lost it today you don't know if you could go on. If it was taken away today, you're not sure if you could push on another day. An idol is something that if you lost it, you become lost. Like your identity is wrapped up in it. You're not sure what life would even be like without that person or that thing. An idol can be a spouse, it can be kids, it can be a pet, it can be a job, it can be a friend, it can be a hobby. An idol can be a house, a car, a piece of land. An idol can be money, it can be a phone, it can be a Facebook account, it can be a video game. An idol could be lifting weights or exercising or it could be food. An idol could be a lifestyle or a way of thinking. An idol could be hunting, fishing, shopping, racing. Uh, 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 An idol can be a sports team or a TV show or just TV in general. It can be your family and it could even be church. An idol can be anything that you put as top priority in your life. An idol is something that you are willing to sacrifice the most important things in your life for. An idol is something that you can't go a day without. Or maybe a week without. I believe that we as a society are a society full of idol worship. I know this is not fun preaching. Stick with me. Let me ask you some questions this morning. What do you sacrifice for? Everybody sacrifices for something. What do you sacrifice for? What gets the first dibs on your time, your attention, and your resources? What are you willing to give up everything for? What is it that if you lost it today, you would be lost? What is it that's number one in your life? 
What is it that distracts you from your relationship with God? What is it that you're putting in front of God? What is keeping you from serving God with your whole life? What is it that you have put on God's throne in your heart? If we could just be honest today, if we could just be real today, we've all turned to idols. At, at some level or another, at a, or another, whether we knew it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, we've all at some point turned to idol worship. We've turned to trust things that can't provide for us. We've given time to things that rightfully belong to God. I want you to think about this. Worship requires sacrifice. Worship requires sacrifice. Worship requires sacrifice. Sometimes when we think about worship, we think about uh, the three or four songs, five songs, six songs we sing on Sunday morning, and we think that's the time when we worship. We think that's the time when we worship. We think that worship is about raising our hands, but really worship is about the way we live our lives. Worship is about bringing a sacrifice to God. And what we do in our lives is we sacrifice our lives to God. We give our whole lives, all of us, over to God. When we think about worship, we think about music. But people in the Old Testament would have thought about an offering, a sacrifice. They never came to worship God without given some kind of sacrifice. What is it that you love? What is it that you're willing to sacrifice? You know, the word love is a funny word in our culture. It can be used to describe any number of things. Anything from a band to a bag of candy can be loved. But I believe that that word love has lost its power in our vocabulary. The word love means that I'm willing to sacrifice for this thing. If you're willing to sacrifice for a bag of candy, then maybe you do love that. But if you're not, then you might want to find another word to describe that. To love something means that you're willing to give of yourself for that thing or for that person. For example, John 3.16 you may, have, may or may not have heard this verse, but it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have eternal life. If you caught that, it says, God loved, and so God gave. God loved, and so God gave. You cannot love someone and never give of yourself to that person. You cannot claim to love somebody if you never give them your time. You cannot claim to love somebody if you never give them your attention. You have to give of yourself to love someone. God loved and so He gave. And if we want to claim to love God, then we too must give. I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about our minds and our emotions and our time to God. To whom or what do you give your thoughts? What do you think about when your mind is idle? What is it that your mind goes to when you're laying there in bed at night trying to fall asleep? Where does your mind go? To whom or what do you give your time? Where do you spend your time? To whom or what do you give your money? To whom or what have you given your love? Where is your heart today? What idols have you given yourself over to today? Here's an interesting question. What do you talk about the most? 
What do you talk about the most when you're in conversation with somebody? What comes up in conversation? Does God come up or is that the avoided subject? I'm not trying to make you feel guilty or bad this morning. I'm just trying to provide you with some truth. What do you talk about? So many times we sacrifice and I don't even think we realize we're doing it. We give up things and we trust in things and (coughs) we can't even see what's happening. We turn to trust in money instead of trusting God who literally owns everything. We turn to trust food because food makes us feel comfortable. Uh, Food makes us feel relaxed. And so we turn to trust food for our peace or our hope instead of trusting in God who knows exactly what we need. We turn to trust a, a, a job to provide for us when God is our provider. Here's one, we turn to a TV show because when we watch a TV show, it gives you a certain level of escape. You can escape your reality when you watch a TV show. And so the reason that TV is so popular is because nobody likes their reality and they want to be able to escape it for just a few minutes. And that's okay until it turns into something you're relying on, something that you need, something that you have to have to go on. We put our hope in a sports team or a celebrity when we could be putting our faith in the one who came and died for us. We put our hope in sex or some other kind of pleasure because there's a hunger inside of us that we long to satisfy, but it'll never be satisfied with anything less than the cross. Sometimes we put our hope in a spouse or maybe a future imaginary spouse because we believe that if we could just get that person to love us or we believe if we could just get that person to pay attention to us or we believe that if we could just marry that person that our life would be complete. We believe that that if I could just find the right person, my life will be complete. I'll be satisfied. But you're looking in the wrong place and it's easy to make that an idol in your life. Sometimes we turn to a Facebook post believing that if we post the right things and enough people like our post, it makes us feel approved. And it makes us feel like a good person. It makes us feel as if we're good instead of turning to the one who can change our heart and our mind. It's easy for us to get distracted by these things. It's easy for us to turn to these things and start trusting in these things. But none of these things are worthy of our worship. None of these things are worthy of our trust. He, Jesus, and Him alone is worthy of our trust and our hope and our love. He is the only one that's worth giving your life to. The tricky things about golden calves is that most of the time they start out as good things. The golden calf that the Israelites made, it started out as a good thing. It started out as a gift given by God and that's how golden calves normally start. A gift given by God that we turn for our own purposes. That we turn for our own desires. God gave them a gift of gold, but the gift became the God. God may give you something, and it may be a good thing. But if you don't manage it, it will begin to manage you. If you don't take control of it, it will begin to control You, sometimes God gives you a good thing, but it turns into a little g God thing before you even know what's happened. Before you even realize that you've given it your heart and you've given it your mind and you've given it all of your attention and your life's consumed by it. 
Guys, the idols that are hardest to deal with in your life are the ones that are good things. Your family is a good thing. But it can be an idol. Your spouse is a good thing. You may not believe that, but they're a good thing. But they can become an idol. Money is a good thing. But it can become an idol. Friends are a good thing. Sports are a good thing. Phones are a good thing. Video games, uh, I guess they're a good thing, but they can become an idol. Your job is a good thing. Helping people is a good thing. But could I tell you today that all those things can become an idol in our life? Here's a tough one. Church is good, but did you know it can become an idol? Not like the people of the church, like the church universal, but how we do church can become an idol. The music that we sing can become an idol. I'm not talking about a particular kind. I'm talking about any kind of music can become an idol. If it is, you'll say something like, if they ever stop singing my kind of music, I'm leaving. That means you have an idol in a certain kind of music. Programs and ministries can become idols. When programs and ministries go from being a means to an end to be an end that the programs and ministries are what it's all about and not accomplishing the goal of reaching lost people for the kingdom of heaven. When they, when they turn that way, they've turned into an idol. And programs and ministries, they turn into idols all the time. They turn into idols all the time because they're good things and we see God move in them. And maybe we help to come up with them, but if we're not careful, they can become an idol. You being a leader in the church is a good thing, but that can become an idol. Facilities, these facilities are good and, and we're going we're gonna to do everything in our power to, to stay right here and, and to proclaim the kingdom of heaven from 5535 Highway 3630. But these buildings can become an idol. The way they look, the way they're shaped, the way we use them can become an idol. We need to be careful about that. Programs are good. Music is good. Leaders are good. Your position in the church is good. But watch out that they don't become an idol. They'll become an idol if you're not careful. So here's what I believe. I believe no matter where you're coming from today or where you've been, you have an idol in your life. There's something that's competing for your attention, your affection, your time, your energy, your devotion to God. Would you let me know that I'm not up here alone? Is that, is, am, am I hitting home out there anywhere? Is anybody with me? That we all have an idol. I know this is not fun, but we all have idols in our life. We all have things that have become God in our life distracted us from God and turned our hearts away from Him. You know the reason that you don't have the passion that you once had for the things of God and the purposes of God? It's because you've allowed an idol to come into your life. And you didn't mean to. You didn't mean to. Nobody who's a child of God says, Oh, today I'm going to set up an idol in my life. The people of Israel, they didn't mean to. They wanted to see God. They didn't say, I want to turn to other gods. They said, show us God. Okay? I know you didn't mean to, but it still has to be dealt with. You still have to do something about the idol in your life. It's easy to slip into idolatry. Nobody... Uh, plunges head first into idolatry. It slips in on us. And it's hard to see in the mirror. It's easy that we stop giving 
our hearts and our lives to God and we start giving them to golden calves. I believe there's only one cure for idol worship. Only one antidote. And that's that we run towards Jesus with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul. And we begin worshiping Him with everything in us. You can't just stop idol worship. You have to replace it with genuine, authentic worship in your life. And so today, I'm sure that God has begun with His Holy Spirit dealing with something in your life. And He's brought to the surface in your heart and you may have said, well, I, I, that's not really uh, a, an idol, that's a good thing. It probably is if the Holy Spirit has begun bringing that up in your heart and your life today. Don't ignore that, okay? Don't ignore that because God's trying to do something in you and you're never going to be free and you're never going to live the life that God wants you to live if you don't deal with this thing in your life. And so God has a zero tolerance policy on idol worship. Okay? The good ones can't stay, the bad ones can't stay. All idols must go. And so I don't know what your idol is today. I don't know what your deal is. I don't know what you're worshiping. And so because of that, I don't know what it looks like to deal with your idol. But here's what our next step is. Our next step is to pray and ask God to show us not only what our idol is, but how we can deal with it in our life. Two things God will do. God will tell you to deal with it radically. That means you don't play games with idol worship. You don't, uh, you don't ease off of idol worship. You stop it right now. He'll do, tell you to do it radically and rapidly. Deal with it now. Deal with it quick. Don't play games with it. He wants to be the one that your whole heart has been given to. He wants to be the one who is the God, who is the center of our lives. And He is the best one to have at the center of our lives. And so I believe that as a, as a, as a church and as individuals, we're never going to reach our full potential if we leave idols in our life. We'll never get to where God wants us to be. You'll never experience the joy that Christ died for you to have if you leave these golden calves up in your life. So, I'd ask for you to begin looking inside of yourself today and see where it is that God needs to, to deal with you. You know, the amazing thing about God is that God knew that you would turn your heart away from Him to little G gods and He still died to save you. And He knew even after your, you had given your life to Him that there would come a day when something began to distract you from His plans and purposes for your life and you would give your devotion to that thing. And He still died for you. And He still loves you. Today there is still hope for you. There's hope for you to tear down this golden calf. And there is grace and forgiveness for you for every sin that you've committed. Including idol worship. And so, today uh, I want to pray for two groups of people. And... Uh, over the next few moments, I, I know that you have things to do and people to see and all that stuff. But over the next few moments, I'd ask that you not get up and move around. I promise you that this is the most important thing going on in your life today. And so there's two groups of people. Uh, if everybody would, would you just bow your head, close your eyes, nobody looking around, I, I'll let you know when it's time for you to look up around. But if you're here today 
and you're a Christian, born again believer in it. And as I've been talking, the Lord's begun to deal with your heart, deal with your mind, and He's brought up an idol in your life. And, and if you're just willing to lay that down today, lay down that idol, get rid of it in your life, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I want to pray that, that God will give you the strength to get through that. So God, I I, I pray for the people who are around this house who have their hands raised, or maybe they don't have their hands raised, but but God, I realize that it's so easy for us to turn our hearts away from you, God. And God, it's so difficult to get back because of the shame and because of we try to talk ourselves out of it. But God, I pray that today that that, that you would begin to free us from the idols that hold us. God, I pray that you would deal with our hearts concerning idol worship in our lives, that, that you would point out and that you would pre- bring to the surface the things that, that are holding us back from you. God, we don't want anything between us and you. God, we thank you that you're doing that right now in the lives of the believers. The next group that I want to talk to is maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ. You've never given Him your whole. Maybe you're even here and and at one point you raised your hand or you talked to a preacher and you thought you were saved, but right now you know that you're not. You know that your heart's never been changed and your life's never been changed. If you want to do that right now, would you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to leads you through a, a, a prayer. And, and if that's you today and you want to give your heart to Christ, I want to, I want to pray and you just pray after me. This is not a, this is not a magic formula. It's just a, a simple prayer that allows God to be the, the center of your life. And so you can say something like, Dear Heavenly Father, I realize I'm a sinner and that I could never save myself. I'm sorry for my sin. And I need you to save me. Forgive my sins. Make me a new person. Make me your son or daughter. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, could we give God a hand for what he's doing in our church today? Right now in this moment... I don't know how God's dealing with you. I don't know what He's instructing you to do. And so right now, you don't have to stand up. You don't have to move around. But I'd ask that you begin to ask God what it is that He wants you to work on in your life, the the idol that He wants to take out of your life. So if you want to pray up here at this altar, you're more than welcome to. If you want to stand up and pray, or if you want to pray in your seats, that's all fine. But right now in this moment, I want to invite you to ask God to deal with your heart and your life about what's going on with you.